Welcome, everyone. My name is Julia Balaz, and today I'm joined by Rona Prince. We got together today with the intention to talk about a fixed star, Izar, or some astrologers call it Izar, located in Buddhist constellation. Rona Prince is one of our certified quantum soul guidance practitioners offering galactic astrology soul readings. You may learn more about her journey in the Galactic Ambassadors podcast that we recorded together last year, the number 54, if you look it up on my Galactic Astrology YouTube channel. Rona is a professional channel of Ascended Masters and Benevolent Galactic Beings since 2004. There is a long introduction of incredible and inspirational achievements on Rona's website, if you go to ronaprince.com. Today, we will focus on this fixed star. Um, a little while ago, Rona got in touch with me when we talked about the fixed star, Izar, in Buddhist constellation, and she shared with me some pretty mind-blowing discoveries and connections that she was able to make as she started tapping into this important star. From some of the astrology texts that we have access to, it, this star has been referred to by ancient peoples of Africa and also some cultures in South America. They refer to this star as the place of the origin of their ancestors, the star beings that came to Earth long, long time ago. I personally have this star conjunct my Pluto within one degree orb. It is trying to excel my lunar nodes. It is excel my midheaven. So whenever I uh, looked at the placements of Izar in my natal chart, I always get a flashback of the stories, how I an, uh, imagined them when I was reading the Old Testament. However, today we are going to go much deeper and through different rabbit holes as Rona was able to make pretty interesting connections to significant uh, humans in our history. So I just really look forward to learning more and uh, offer you space, Rona, for sharing some of your discoveries. And we look forward to hearing some of the feedback and comments from the viewers to see how it resonated, or is there anything else that, that came up as you were tuning into this star? All right, welcome, Rona. Great, thanks. Thanks, Julia. And that's, that's really interesting to hear your connections and the feelings that come up as I, I have really always been about uh, the feelings first, the heart first. And, and it's sometimes a difficult role to be in as a paradigm changer when you are ahead of people, but that makes sense to me now. You know, my film that came out in 2012, Sacred Journey of the Heart was a bit of a paradigm changer, I would say, because I was suggesting the world isn't a mental construct. It's a feeling and a sensing place first and a mental place second. Um, and so I, I've always felt into things with my heart and I also have placements with these are in my chart, um, sextiles and trines mainly, you know, and in, in the, um, moon in my North node, South node. And so I just had, had a sense of some of the stories that were told by, uh, ancient astrologers, uh, where, you know, giving them their names and their, mm, sort of their characteristics have been coming through an old lens where, uh, there, there was, you know, certain power over structures in place. And so the, these stories, you know, have been told through a different lens that were, that were now in Aquarius able to open up. And I have, you know, connection in my chart, Mercury with a trine to reticulum, which I fi finally started to really understand it, you know, like the little crosshairs of a, tele of a telescope to look into certain timelines into future timelines and past and sort of open up like we say lifting the veil which is also one of the names of Izar is the veil uh, one of the one of the translations of the name so it's exciting to be able to to talk about this a little bit and just share ideas and you know some of these interesting things that I uncovered that's so fascinating where you mentioned the connection to the stories of you know power over structure the the vision that I get instantly when I hear the is our star name and the placement in my chart the the vision is always the mass exodus people walking through yeah. desert feeling like they are in the exile you know someone some power over sent them out of their own home that belonged to them and they had to leave and find new home elsewhere so that um instantly resonated as a as an important connection and it's i believe something that you will talk about some more 
in terms of the findings that you that you would like to share? Yeah, I, I connect the the people who have important placements with is our uh, a word I would use is very resilient, resilient people that have That's you right. know have a lineage of. Uh, ancestors behind them that may have, you know, been uh, groundbreakers or have had to leave home. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, continent of Africa has some important placements uh, with older transits in the 1700s with Izar. And that was a mass unwilling exodus out of their homeland over into the, into the slave trade. And um, I, that I just find this really deep core of resilience that, there's a there's a strength that's different than some other star system strength but it's like we will find a way and i think that's why they've gotten connected with some star races that are that are considered maybe threatening um you know that that came in after the fact and may have in lower densities been challenging to other star nations but i think of ultimately it's a very resilient strong strong um group of people that carry these markings in their charge and that's what led me on to this this whole theme, which in, in becoming certified, of course, I spent a lot of time with my significant other's chart. And this is where I first came upon this issue. And in his chart, he's a, a true Arcturian metaphysician, as I discovered with both Izar and uh, Arcturus in his chart, and it's right in his ascendant. So I was trying to understand, I understood Arcturus, but when I saw this uh, placement in his chart at you know, there is high degrees of Libra, 26 degrees of Libra is where, where this, uh, this falls. Uh, I, I started looking into it and I believe it was, yes, Astro King. I looked into it and right at the very top of his description as well, let's, who else has ascendant at Buddhist eyes are as Adolf Hitler. And so I really needed to understand what that meant because this is, you know, seemingly kind of a dark history as someone who has that on their ascendant. So that sent me on the hunt of understanding that and i think there's like like anything there's a a light and a dark side to every star every every human being we're made up of of both of those and so we could see uh i think what happened and and this is through my channeling we, we could see that the there is a very powerful urge to have power over people and to have a worldview that is dominated by one way one lifestyle and in hitler's case it was the aryan race which is an interesting a world domination <laughs> attempt to take over, which didn't succeed. So I started digging deeper into that. And I also discovered that there was, there's an individual who lives in Ireland still named Duncan Lunan, who came across some very astounding findings with Izar in the 1970s. It was so groundbreaking and it landed him on the front page of Time Magazine, uh, which is, he said, got it wrong. So he, we've got to be careful. And I don't, want to misquote or misrepresent his work i hadn't haven't had a chance to talk to him so the only publication that got his story right interestingly enough was the u.s national Enquirer, which is known as one of these um what's the name from a rag or something you know they always have aliens on the picture and i heard that and i'm like that's interesting because there's a whole story here uh, they got it right. The The archives of the National Enquirer don't go back to 1972. They stop at 77. So I couldn't get to that yet. Yeah. I really don't want to misrepresent his work. And I'm not at all suggesting that he's making this connection that I have because he, he noticed that there was a signal. It's called an LDE, which I believe is a long distance echo, radio echo that was circulating somewhere between the earth and the moon and it was actually first found in either 1919 or 1920 i believe by a norwegian geophysicist named carl stormer and his dutch collaborator and they didn't know what to do with it with the instrumentation of the time they just it was a repeating signal and it would echo it acted very strange it wasn't anything that they had ever seen and so it just kind of sat there in i guess the history books and then duncan lunan came along in the 70s and I don't even want to represent what he does or anything. He's been so misrepresented in the press that I would only <laughs> say that I he somehow got a hold of this information. I know he wrote some science fiction, but he's a very um, multi-talented individual. And he claimed that he translated this signal. And that made the front page, first of all, in the in the in Great Britain, and then it got picked up in different places. And um 
what it truly said, what he truly said, it said, I don't know. Um, it was mistranslated that somebody said, look here first, but he said that wasn't right. And so I just kept following the trail of information because in his estimation, it took 13,000 years for that message in terms of what we knew about the location and distance of Izar to reach this place between the moon and the earth. It's an so interesting thought, time a connection if we are going back to 12 to 15,000 years and talking about a lot lately of the echo of the Atlantean era, the Aquarius, the Leo. Yes. That's very interesting. Keep going. Well, that's, and this is, he said, you know, ele so 11,000 BC is when he believes that that signal first, you know, had, had was sent from Izar to get here. So that would be, you know, 2024 minus another. So 13,000, 11,000 BC. And in my work and with the with the masters and the Atlantean masters and the beings that I work with uh, that had a lot to do with the construction of that civilization and also it, were there in the downfall. Um, they said this was a joint venture cooperation with individuals Atlantean frequency masters who lived there and they knew something was going on, the vibrations, the frequencies are getting off. Uh, and they were working with many multi-talented individuals and, and seers and sages and mages. And there was a sense that we we're going to have the downfall of this community. And there really wasn't a whole lot. A lot of people tried to do things. I deal with a lot of people's Atlantean karma in my work, by the way. And it's really a joy to see people unburdened from this feeling I didn't do enough. It's so common, you know, because so many people had the sense that something's not right. And that trauma is echoing into here today when it looks like, you know, when we have the big, the outer planets moving and doing interesting dances in the next, you know, to uh, this year and the next few years ahead, it's a similar feeling. You know, we see the similar setup with, you know, schools, uh, schools, putting kids in front of machines instead of people. And, you know, we all probably aware of this politics without heart and religion without soul, I would have to say, in some cases you, you see that, unfortunately. And so the, the seers who were able to look into the future were saying, we, this is an experiment that is probably going to fall into the, into the ashes or what we know, if we know tarot, it was a tower experience, which is the 16 archetype of, of tarot. And so my sense is then they looked into the timelines as there's another possibility, let's say about 13,000 years later, where we could have a flourishing of a world that's united in what uh, my guides call the Holy Grail. Unity, peace, love is the Holy Grail, according to the beings I work with. And that is very high positive potential that's going to be in this decade um, not 2012. I knew that it was not, which was 20. <laughs> I always said it was the decade of the 2020s, which when I do the, my numerology, my main modality, which is orchestrating in the optimistic paradigm shift. That's, that is a 2020 vibration. And so they said, but huh, uh oh, there's a problem in the timelines. The seers <laughs> and the prophetesses would say there is something happening in around the beginning of the 1900s in the 1990, 1919 timeframe, there is a being who has an agenda that could collapse this whole thing. It could result in the destruction of planet Earth. Again, this is my channeling, not Duncan Lunans, just be really clear. And so they sent from Atlantis here on planet Earth, this message up to Izar telepathically and said, would you please bounce it back? 13,000 years ago. So it's going to land in about 1919. That makes sense. Wow. Find somebody who could translate it. Well, they found a Norwegian geophysicist, interestingly enough, because if you know World War II history, that I've always been a phenomenal buff in, especially the little known, lesser known things like the invasion of Norway. The My channel message was that they were trying to warn people they thought that could translate this about the rise of someone who had ascendant, Libra 2635, conjunct with his eyes are. You're talking had, about Adolf Hitler's ascendant. And this is Adolf Hitler's ascendant. And it was about in 1919 when he really started his rise to power. And so I thought my sense is they were trying to warn humanity of Hitler's numerology, by the way, Adolf Hitler is a 56, which is when I look at this through Orosoma, that's connected with the ascended master Saint Germain, which is very high energy of the transmutation of karma but just like anything there's a positive and a negative that's also about the veil and cloaking well what is eyes are called the veil cloaking this this 
big worldwide, you know, domination, megalomania, uh, power vision that he had. And his life path, Hitler's life path was a five, which is about change. And it can be, you know, revolutionary chaos, basically. So then when you put his 56, which is an 11, now I know people are going, oh, what are these numbers? We really do know numbers. We know them deep inside. 11 is about a choice. And 11 plus five, that's a 16. So Hitler was programmed with a tower experience for humanity that was going to be the destruction of life as we knew it for, for many, many years. So I, I found that that's what was attempted. And so when now that here we are in Aquarius time, all this is getting opened up again. And I think there are so many more of us willing to look at these galactic connections and saying, okay, we're here to usher in the optimistic paradigm shift to be sure we came into these timelines so we could get to this time, you know, this next 20 years and, and with Pluto and Aquarius and see, you know, where, what really is our, is our future? What's our destiny? And we're going to create it very consciously. We're taking the veil off. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm very apolitical, but you know, there's, there's very similar, you know, sorts of people trying to control freedom and sovereignty right now. And so I think it's really important that we, expand our lens of perception because there's signs are here that we have this wonderful opportunity to move and shift into this holy grail of the time optimism um uh, the optimistic paradigm shift of unity peace love yeah the yeah. message has been drilled into our collective consciousness over and over for the last decade that we create our reality what we focus on where the uh, attention goes the energy flows and manifestation follows and on and on with regards to the message that was translated you've mentioned that it was misinterpreted and is there do you get a sense of what the message actually was is it is it fairly short or or longer and so the gist of it was the warn to warn humanity that was that was part of it and it, it's also about this return of the holy grail that we will come to a time that, that we find the holy grail within and that was part of hitler's issue he was he literally had a very deep relationship with the occult and and you know in the indiana jones movie that came out decades ago was was based on a lot of reality and he was sending crews all over the place occultists he worked with you know di different types of magic he was trying to find the holy grail he was looking out there and he couldn't and his placements of reticulum were squares in his chart he could not see the future and so um, when I have, the, I have it right here, he's got a, oh, he's got interesting things in his chart. I don't know if you want to spend a whole lot of time. So the him, reticulum, but... just for those who, who will want to catch the name of the star system we're mentioning here is Alpha Reticuli, the brightest star in the reticulum constellation. And we find that people who have uh, conjunct, trine or sextile, especially conjunctions to the star system, they can be really good at uh, grasping complex concepts and topics and be able to analyze a lot of data and make sense of it. And as you say, also seeing into future potential timelines, uh, whereas the square alignments may actually make it really difficult to um, to do something like that. So interesting you made yeah. that observation. Or, or as we say with our clients, difficult to do that in earlier life, you know, but, but some, and we can develop those faculties if we work at it. Well, Hitler's uh triclum square is square his moon in his third house which was uh, opposite sirius b so he he really had a difficult time with feelings his it, i found it really interesting um to look at his the composition of his chart and how much you know he, he doesn't have he doesn't have any water in his chart whatsoever you know there's there was wow. a, a and I, he was looking for the holy grail to help him have power over if he could find these sacred objects the ark of the covenant the uh, Holy Grail, and the uh, the other thing is the ring. And as you, I might have shared with you that those objects and massive super galactic objects, have just, all three of them have been found recently in the last year by a, a relatively young astrophysicist in the UK. But the, these are the span 10% of the sky, the, the, the arc. Then they've somehow serendipitously called them the great arc, the big ring. And the other one's called I think the, the Great Wall, but I think of that as the rails. For those who would like to look into that, what would be a good uh, reference so that we can search for more information on that? Do you know? I found it, I think, just by searching the big ring. And that was, I think, announced just a, a 
in January in the astronomy. Like astronomy discovery, big rain. Yeah, big rain. And and the other one I think is a great arc. So it's like how you can't even make this stuff up because we have, you know, this this was what people who are trying to have power over were searching for these objects. If they could just get these objects, then they could Hitler thought he could control the world. And that's that's what he wanted to do. And he unleashed but the missing that component was the inner journey yes, and yeah. the inner work i find it fascinating that he had zero water element in his charts of any newbies to astrology that just means yeah. uh, i don't know why i want to say emotionally naked person you know, um, like dysthymia is the word but what is it it's yeah. it's really just it's mainly zero emotion, it's, clear emotion and more uh, being in the mental it's in his uh, head and you know his venus and mars are pretty much on top of each other's seventh house in Taurus. And he also has Mercury in his seventh house uh, with, you know, the intellect sitting there in Aries. So he, uh, he's got uh, 51% of his chart is fixed also. So um, quite a, quite a big character. And he did, uh, he became very close to succeeding. And so I was looking at his chart is interesting of showing what happens and the risk when we're looking for the Holy Grail and the, and the Ark of the Covenant, these sacred objects outside ourselves. And and the, the work really is, I think, facing our own inner demons, our own shadow. And that's been really helpful for me in galactic astrology as I finally come to terms I was sharing with you to having such a big placement in my first house, Pluto and Draco Thuban. And that thanks to our wonderful giving community. They just talked about that being the dark light workers and trauma breakers. And that is, I, if I was, I didn't even know that, but if I could define myself as I am a trauma breaker and I surround myself with incredible healers, like my Arcturian metaphysician healer here's office I'm sitting in, who has the same alignments as Adolf Hitler, but he's got a lot more water in his chart. He's a Pisces. And so he's got a ton of water. He's got, you know, Leo moon, but, but everybody with that Libra high degrees of Libra 26 degrees has pretty much the same line and it's opposite the Andromeda galaxy. So I find that really interesting because I think the people that I'm seeing that I'm working with in their charts and we see that connection with Andromeda and I have my little, this is my little check, pendulum checker on the, about the heavy dutiest gold chain you can get because I used to have pendulums fly apart. But everybody who's here with this Izar and Andromeda placement who are interested in our work are uh, Andromedan envoys uh, and working with the Galactic Federation of Worlds so right right down right down the line I also then they're doing groundbreaking work for example Robert Edward Grant that I, somebody just put his chart on same placement the same exact assignment uh, ascendant Buddhist eyes are Andromeda galaxy it's about a seven eight line you know square long chart and he just announced if you, you probably may know this about finding all the markings on the inside of the king's chamber that represent the deacons of astrology he's got an incredible podcast just out so is and all this is lining up and that's what i'm talking about these are the sort of paradigm changers that these people are he's he's even had the egyptian government giving him the keys from the pyramids oh they are yeah they let him have uh, they, you know. they, they have huge respect for him and for his wisdom and um the pop the synchronicities or the openings and discoveries that are occurring when he's when he's present in the pyramids but i just want to clarify something when we made it when you made a connection with adult hitler's chart where uh, is ours on his ascendant I feel like there could be a miscommunication or misinterpretation of the influence of this star. I really feel stronger emphasis on the resilience and what can come from it as a result where that quality is present in person's nature, where they persist and deliver something that is important despite forces that may be going against them or try to put power over them, just like the people in the mass exodus in the old testament they persevered and found new land so was your implication that the Izar star is also giving the quality of wanting to dominate and or or was that uh, frequency in adult hitler's chart a combination of all the other placements because I don't feel the Izar connection as, as something, as a quality that of someone that will want to dominate uh, in, in some way where it's absolutism, like was in, in Hitler's 
uh, chart right. uh, or like in Robert Edwards Grant's work and the you know what he's offering the world it, it feels more like that resilience frequency uh, in his mm -hmm. case and the gentleman that you've mentioned that you have huge respect for uh, in your proximity on his ascended also do you see that coming out more as his resilience and what comes out of that or would you have noticed the wanting to dominate frequency do you know what i'm saying i don't I, yeah i know what you're saying and yeah and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that i don't want to give that impression it's because it's hitler it's all we look at the chart holistically you know and you, you we start all in and, and it's it's many things plus you have to have the you know the upbringing where there there's a sense of separation isolation differentness otherness mm -hmm. loneliness which which a lot of us carry anyway um you know hitler's pluto is i think a conjunct hiatum and i think any person who gets to be obsessed with power is is very much in, in inner pain mm -hmm. and he i think he's carrying even an old story of the the from gal the galactic <laughs> astrology that we think of as the the sisters of hiatum who suffered the loss of their brother who was who was killed and they were in mourning and grief and he comes in with that in pluto and then you know squaring formal hout which is the you know kind of we connect that in a way with the message of the of jesus and those times let's love each other instead of from our pain hurt each other so there's everything that comes together in in a, in a chart um and then the combination of how are we raised and <laughs> what nurtures us or doesn't nurture us because what I've channeled a long time is a med big message of many wisdom teachers is healing the great poverty, which is I'm not enough. And that's where all pain comes in and that you can be a, a billionaire and very clearly demonstrate that you're suffering from great poverty. Um, so that is the, the teachings of these, the wisdom masters. And, you know, he's got, Hitler has square, the Cygnus to Neb in his Pluto line. And he kind of, which in astrology, we say that's, you know, maybe boundaries being, being broken and burst through and, um, or having difficulty, you know, determining boundaries. And I think of the, the many lives and the homes <laughs> that were lost because of he's breaking through the boundaries of individuals, sovereignty and freedom. So it's the whole, the chart as a whole, but I find people with, I is are very aware of, the, the entire spectrum you know the things that are being covered up as well as things are now becoming um more and more open and so they carry these deep ancestrally based secrets that are i think are now like in robert grant's work being able to be shared with the world so i would like to invite the viewers to see where is our is placed in their natal chart and in particular which house uh, which life area so for me, for example, it's sitting on my sixth house in conjunct to, to Pluto, and uh, it would show up through my resilience when I have to go through daily tasks and things that are work-related that, that sometimes there are so many obstacles in the way, and I just keep moving through them to the point sometimes where I'm thinking no one would do this. Like I always feel like it, it's going to be worth it when, when I blow through it. So, if, so if it's um, maybe in the seventh house, is this a person perhaps that is able to withstand all kinds of relationship issues and obstacles and blocks. And eventually if they pursue uh, certain connections it's it's worth it and something really beautiful and amazing can be can come through certain um, partnerships or you know any other life areas can our viewers comment based on the house and the life area do they notice that they have greater capacity for being resilient to the point where they can enjoy the fruits of their labor and not just for themselves but for others as well as a result of their influence just thought I'll put that in. Yeah, and I I have a client who I've uh, uh, that I've worked with who is most definitely a blueprinter. So it's somebody that really carries these blueprints of, you know, creation realities within her. And she has uh, is our uh, in her north node, of course, conjunct and opposite south node in Libra second house and eighth. So I wonder if you would just you know, for example comment on that. Um, somebody that has that. So where is Isar? Which it is it conjunct her north node in the second house and okay. opposite in the eighth, of course. 
So perhaps their experience of self-worth and what they value has been in inherently strong regardless of what is coming at them through the eighth house of what other people perceive is important, they would not budge because they are the blueprinter. They carry what is the original divine design. So they may have felt like they had to not necessarily fight for, but stand up for the true values that are at the core of their being, not changing. So then the relationship between the eighth house, if it's their North Node, they kind of have to find a way to also listen to the other people's needs and motivations and what other people may value so that they can find a way to communicate correctly the importance of honoring the original divine blueprints and design. Because if they are not going to relate and hear the eight house people first about what is important mm -hmm. to them, they will not be able to find common language in order to convert uh, people to something that feels as original or organic uh, nature, you know, what is important in our values. Does that resonate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that does. And I, and I think that's, that's helpful too. That eighth house placement has been a little challenging sometimes uh, for that individual. And so I, I think that'll be helpful too. It helps me. So thanks for that. And, um, um, the other, I want to talk about Dwight Eisenhower because of the, this is today that we're recording the 70th anniversary of him reportedly having a very um, hidden until recently interaction with a non-human intelligence. So basically he went, we think, and a very reliable source tells a story that on February 20th, 1954, he went on a what they called a visit to the dentist where he was off the off being tracked for about 45 minutes. And, a, and let me see if I can find the individual who who did this. His name was a, a it was US Senator that finally finally came out. And you can find this article if you check uh, you know, pres if you Googled President Eisenhower met uh, met with aliens. So this is an article, it's, it's out there that uh, this is Henry McElroy, retired U.S. state representative in May 2010, did an interview about this. And he goes through the process that he said, this is what, you know, we really think happens that he actually went to, to Holloman Air Force Base, where they do all the flight research and development projects for the military. And remember that President Eisenhower was the leader, you know, became a general during the Second World War, and he led the... Um, I can't remember what the operation, it's not coming to my mind, but that led the invasion of Normandy and eventually led to Hitler's downfall. Uh, but he had, uh, 50, 70 years ago, was we have, I believe, and I've checked into this, you know, that this is true, a connection and met with these non-human uh, beings. And I believe uh, there were several things going on with this, uh, but this was right at the beginning of, you know, the nuclear, the Cold War and the nuclear prol proliferation. And I believe he was told by these not these uh, extraterrestrials that we are going to ensure that uh, nuclear, the humanity does not destroy itself. It was rather shocking to other uh, non-Earth, non, <laughs> what we call other civilizations, other star nations that we developed that atomic bomb and that it was actually dropped. And so a lot of attention got focused here on what was going on in the planet. And now we know around the globe last year, there was a lot of uh, disclosure information in different governments of the world, including uh, an open a Senate hearing, which was partially open. And the things that I read say that a lot of the military are upset are not liking this because they're dearming nuclear missiles. They'll come in and go fly over bases and disarm these these this missiles. Um, but they, I believe, they did meet with him seventy years ago today, and he came out of that actually very optimistic. And he gave in his farewell speech um, a very optimistic view that we we can have uh, peace in a, in the nuclear era. That was his hope, and I think he he received that message. Now, some people have said too that he was involved in making treaties with other nations that allowed for the um, alien abduction of certain number of humans and other animals. And I don't go a whole lot into that, but you know, that's kind of a more advanced topic, but I'm not sure about that. I just do feel that when, then when you look at with me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but like making a trying to make a treaty with people who don't have, you know, who are not benevolent is going to be broken. And so, but we've got the Tau Setians on our side, I think, that have come in and done a lot of rescue missions. But he gave it another important speech called Adams for Peace. And I actually found that also through some of our course material. That's a, a galaxy that is actually in, I believe it's at 23 degrees Aquarius. And so that's really active right now. So I think we're, we're potentially coming into, even though it might not look like it, another time where we really can have this proliferation of the Holy Grail within the, the, the unity, peace, and love. And we've got this beautiful little galaxy through the, called Adams for Peace Galaxy through the Aquarian constellation in the high degrees. And it's for me, you know, great big beacon of hope. But boy, if you look at, and it's on our public list, I put Dwight Eisenhower's chart. If you look at his chart, it has a major placement with the super galactic points on almost every line. It's, it's just an incredible human being. Even though he spent a lot of years in the military, he's a 16 life expression. So those that type of tower person again can come in and take down those who are trying to impinge on the sovereignty of the world. And he and what beautifully he's a six life path. And he was born six months after Hitler. So they were very close in age. And so but he's a six, which is the you know the family love and community. And you put those two together and his numerology is a 22, a master builder. So he was they're trying, you know, doing what he had to do to try to create peace through this most threatening time for our survival as a species. So my sense is he's kind of a watch, a guardian of, of our of our planet right now. He worked very, very hard for peace. He left a lot of hints in some of his later speeches about his his communication with on human uh, life intelligence. And he this day, the 20 is. 20th that we're on is so important. It was that date 70 years ago. He was president from January 20th to January 20th <laughs> for two terms. And, you know, there's just a lot of energy of 20. And we call that in the tarot that I have associated with Orisoma, 20 is called Star Child Rescue. Mm -hmm. So that is really a kind of an energy that's coming in. The, the frequency word of 20 is balance, but it's balancing our human consciousness with our galactic star heritage that we've been around and done a lot of amazing things in our, um, you know, in our star history. And I, I love how it just opens people's consciousness. Once they kind of integrate it, it takes, a, it takes a few weeks, but it's like, wow, really? It's like, yeah, we're so much more than, you know, just this earth cycle and this one lifetime. I love how randomly we selected the 20th of February for this recording. <laughs> you can't I realized it this up. morning. I'm like, really? That's, that was the date. <laughs> yeah, I can't, you can't make this up. And I really do believe that any new discovery that occurs now and going forward in any uh, discipline, it all contains key words, codes for for the ascension, for the awakening, for remembering, for activation of of the uh, highest uh, potential in our timeline I, I really feel like there is no coincidence in anything i'm just noticing it all the time through galactic astrology how these seemingly random uh, events and creations and collaborations they always occur very <laughs> precisely on on certain dates and like any of the words of the new discoveries like just some of those that you've mentioned there today just fascinating I, it feels like the supreme intelligence is very playful very deliberate in how it communicates with us through all these different signs and clues and hints that some of them were left or communicated to us from thirteen thousand years ago very particularly into this era although several decades decades ago but uh, what if a lot of other stuff has also been carefully planned by high councils, by beings that are of supreme intelligence, that understand the extraordinary times that we live in and all the celestial alignments and connection to other star systems and other galaxies. There's just so much going on. If we only knew, we yeah. would be just in awe and deep gratitude for the immense support that we have from our star brothers, star sisters. And I'm over here smiling and beaming because I know, you know, as I, I translate words all the time in long phrases, the highest positive potential 
equals one, two, three. It's a start oh, code. And here's my hundred and here's my body's bottles back here that go up to bottle 122. So in the world of Orosoma, which is living light of these codes, we're waiting for one, two, three bottle to come out. I'm hoping it'll be around these eclipses, which these bottles are born, but that's what we're moving towards is our highest positive potential. And you asked me a little earlier, the, the rest of the translation of the message that was sent from Izar. And I, I believe it was very high beings of, of consciousness and love that were, were beaming something in. So I asked, as I do before a lot of sessions, give me a code because I will translate numbers into frequency. And the first number that came out, and I'm working a lot with an Andromedan guide whose name is Amenia, which I come to find out means diamond in Armenian. Uh, the first number was one, 111, 111. It came out of this code today. And that uh, is a lot of different words. I have hundreds of those frequencies, but um, the one that she was telling me today is the, the what we are really need, starting to understand that the Holy Grail is all beings, all times, all space, all one. And that equals 111. And so is the light network of ascension. So is the divine nexus of all ascension. So is sacred journey of the heart. And she said, this is what, when we start understanding frequency, especially the master trinity frequencies, we'll really be able to see the light and the dark wholeness within each one of us and and not separate it out and overvalue the light or be afraid of the dark you know and one of the things she said too is that the holy grail is very sacred amongst all galaxies and so they usually place it in three different areas within and within a galaxy because it fuels the search first it looks like a search out there then we finally turn it in here i think there's uh, secret guardians on uh, with the arcturians on on in booties with the, the part a very important part of the healing of that you know finding the holy grail within specifically the newlands the art of the, which is a race of star beings and then uh, the other one may be speaker the the womb of the of the mother perhaps but so i think there's three places and that the awareness of that we can start bringing those in we can look at our star history and say do we have something to do with the holy grail and the ark of the covenant and helping people remember uh, that this is an inner search that this is the sacred journey of the heart 111 that we find those things within us so that we stop coming from the great poverty or, you know, shadow part that we disown and then project into the world, which is what I would say, I think we all know that's, that's what cruelty is about, projecting our inner pain on someone else. So I have great hope that we are going to make it through this time and, um, you know, find that brilliant diamond that we carry within and see ourselves really as one group, one people without needing to separate and divide universal beings. I'm curious about your perspective on the idea that as we strive for the highest potential positive timeline, isn't it inevitable that there will have to be counterbalance of the opposite negative experience somewhere here on earth as a result? So that, you know, as the earth holds the space for polarized experience. So we may see a lot of amazingness happening, more and more greater awakenings, deeper sense of love, a greater ability to feel and perceive quantum uh, with our conscious awareness. But at the same time, is it going to be a time where perhaps there is greater amount of war and suffering on the other spectrum of human population? What is your... Do you have a perspective that is healthy to hold this awareness that well, are present? The the big question, right? To the 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 um it looks kind of like the light and dark and the good and evil, but I, I believe it's uh a place here of great free will choice. And there there's always the opportunity to choose love. And this is the and yes, there are painful things that happen. I don't deny it. I was uh, screening my film at the Israeli Film Festival uh, in 2013, where there was bombings outside. And they're like, well, what can you be talking about this heart thing when this is going on? And and the, the message that we shared is it really is, it begins here at home. And a 2024 frequency match is shift love. 
that equals 44. The vowels are 20, the consonants are 24. So this is one of the frequency matches for this year. And so I, I didn't quite know what that meant. What do they mean? Shift love. And so that's when I first connected with my Andromedan messenger, Amenia. And she, and it's on my Vimeo channel. I think it, it's listed under Sacred Journey of the Heart. But she said, shift love is this simple. We shift, we think of love first thing in the morning. We think of it when we go to bed, before we speak to anybody. We shift into that love frequency. And it also then gives rise to compassion and empathy then to help other people who are having those tower experiences or the or the or the 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 war and the loss of their home and their and their freedoms and so that's where i think more and more people shift love and put that at the forefront in this year of 2024 we'll have more solutions coming instead of just saying oh look at that problem and look at that we are the we're the solution <laughs> for makers and the ones that are i think are here to bring comfort and solace and you know we i've had my share of challenges also and uh, that's just given me more of that resilience to um be able to help others and and even myself if some of that stuff happens so i i like to say this is the year of shift love and that's exactly what it means do the do that come from that first perfect you know when i was looking at the constellation map to see where Zar is exactly it seems to be on the right rib of the plowman is that how you pronounce it plowman plowman mm -hmm. and i wonder the symbology of that could it connect to the right rib or the puncture into jesus's right side uh, as he was on the cross you know as that last dig to bring him down and break him apart yet it didn't work so maybe again that sign or code of resilience that example i don't know why i feel like i want to bring that in i don't think anyone ever made that connection i wonder about the what is supposed to be the eve is supposed to come is that from the right rib of adam is maybe maybe it's oh. the, because you know in the zohar ancient judaic text that she's the second wife with first and said, I'm not going to be subordinate to this man. And so the so <laughs> Adam said no. And he got yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Brilliant. But that's I think the Chinese call is our the the something about the tip of the spear. So that also let's make you know how our minds use and make, make connections. Yeah. They call it something to do with the spear or the lance, but who knows? Maybe it's about the uh bringing back the equality of <laughs> masculine, feminine, whatever. Yeah. Very good. I love it. Uh, just a few more facts that uh, we didn't mention at the beginning that this fixed star is 150 light years away from us. And our sun conjuncts the star on the 20th or around 20th of October each year. So daytime Northern Hemisphere located people can meditate with the intention to connect and receive the highest wisdom, highest love from this big star around the 20th of October. This was very rich, very fascinating, a lot to ponder here. Thank you so much, uh, Rona. I hope this recording will help people who will find a uh, placement of Zara in their natal chart, recognize the resilience as a quality of their being and uh, maybe have a good think about how they can leverage that quality to support their own uh, life experience and, of course, uh, everyone else around them. And I'll look forward to reconnecting with you again in future. People can find you on ronaprince.com. Your Vimeo account, there is a membership, right, that you offer where you share channelings on all kinds of fascinating topics. Where would you like to invite people to connect with you for if they would like more? Just, uh, yeah, Rana at Sacred Journey of the Heart. I have some things out there that now, for the first time ever, my my channeling is available on that. So it's usually all membership only, but I have some things now that I'm starting to open, open up. up and let other people see. So. Oh, we love that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, yeah, thank for you. watching. We send you much love and joy. Be well, and I'll see you again soon. All right. Thank you.